right, if you have your Bibles, Psalm 107 is where we're going to be. Psalm 107. We're spending the month of July just looking at different psalms that have been uh, meaningful for the different speakers, um, psalms that have just stood out. And so this morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 107. And then through these psalms, we're looking at an attribute or a trait of God that um, should make us worship Jesus more. And so this morning what I want to look at is that God is loyal. God is loyal. Psalm 107 is long. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if I should read the entire passage or not, but um, it's 43 verses. So let me highlight just a few verses from here that I'm going to be looking at, and then um, we will look into this passage. So I'll just highlight a few verses. Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the power of the foe. Go down to verse 4. Some wandered in the desolate wilderness, finding no way to a city where they could live. They were hungry. They were thirsty. Their spirits failed within them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He rescued them from their distress. He led them by the right path to a city where they could live. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love, for his wondrous works for all humanity. He has satisfied the thirsty filled the hungry with good things. Others sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners in cruel chains, because they rebelled against God's command and despised the counsel of the Most High. He broke their spirits with hard labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness and the gloom and broke their chains apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. For he has broken down the bronze gates and cut through the iron bars. Fools suffered affliction because of their rebellious ways and their iniquities, and they loathed all food and came near the gates of death. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He sent his word and he healed them. He rescued them from the pit. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and announce his works with shouts of joy. Others went to sea in ships, conducting trade on the vast water. They saw the Lord's works, his wondrous works in the deep. He spoke and raised a stormy wind that stirred up the waves of the sea. Rising up the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like a drunkard, and their skill was useless. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet, and he guided them to the harbor that they longed for. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Go down to verse 43. Let whoever is wise pay attention to these things and consider the Lord's act of his faithful love. Loyalty. Loyalty is something that we all desire, but something we rarely experience. It's something that our culture is lacking as we witness the fragmentation happening every single day. Just a quick glance at the news, even this week, seems to show how no one is able to be loyal to each other. No one seems to trust each other. And this is not just an issue for our nation. It's a global issue. It's a human issue. Loyalty is something we all want from other people, but something we rarely give. It's something we want from God, or at least we believe is true about God. We want to believe that God is a God of love and purity and loyalty, but we don't find it when we look in the created world. We look out into the world and we don't see faithfulness but unfaithfulness. We don't see loyalty but disloyalty. We don't see, we don't see faithfulness but we see fickleness. We, see, we don't see devotion but betrayal. We don't see fidelity but infidelity. We're haunted by unfaithfulness all around us. And so we ask, is there a loyal God? 
Is there a God that exists that is truly loving and loyal? And the answer is a resounding yes. The Bible teaches us that God is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, three different persons. And the reasons we were created and all the universe was created was out of an overflow of love within the Godhead. And we were made to revel in that love, join in that dance, delight in that God. And when we don't, we disintegrate and fall apart as is witnessed all over the world today. We must find our identity in something out of this world apart from God, whether it's our accomplishments or our apparent morality or our upbringing or our family or our position or even the color of our skin. And when our identity is not in the gospel of Jesus, when it's not in the triune God, we must find a way to better be better than other, others because our soul has to reach for something when it doesn't rest in God. See, the Bible has a word for that when we choose not to delight in God. It's called sin. God created this world and gifted it to us as a beloved home. He bestowed upon us dignity as his image bearers and calls us into a relationship with him where he says, I will be your father and you will be my children. God spoke nothing but love to us and did nothing but bless us. And our response, unfortunately, has been sin. Damnable, horrible, inexcusable sin. Preferring creation rather than the creator. And thus, that's the reason why we don't see loyalty in the world that we live in. And what's absolutely shocking about the God of the Bible is that God's response to our rebellion, God's response to our sin, God's response to our disobedience is loyalty. Covenant-saving, glorious, loving covenant, which shouldn't surprise us because Scripture teaches us that God is a loyal, covenantal God. He sent Adam and Eve out of the garden so that he could rescue them. And because this is who God is, he offers to you and I the same loyalty in the form of a covenant. He offers a conditional, unconditional covenant, one where you enter on conditions by faith and repentance, but is maintained by unconditional commitments on God's love, on his loyalty, on his grace, sovereignly giving and given and being kept for you. See, God has a word for this unconditional commitment on his part. In Scripture, it's called hesed. Hesed is the centerpiece of Psalm 107. You find it in verse 107 and in verse 43, which serves as the bookends of this chapter. It is, basically means covenant loyalty, covenant love. It is God's consistent, ever faithful, relentless, unrestrained, one-way love to his people who have come to faith in him through Jesus. I love the way the children's storybook, the Jesus Storybook Bible, it says it best. He says, God loves us with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. There's loyalty in this world, and it is found in the face of Jesus. Hesed, this covenant love, is where God binds himself to this covenant people. He has promised to be faithful merciful, gracious, and loyal, despite what his people may do, whether that be good things or whether that be bad, despite where they find themselves in, whether of their own doing or the doing of others, despite whether they are deserving or undeserving, God will be hesed. God will be loyal, period. It's something that you don't see in other human beings. It's something you don't see in other world religions. It's something you don't even see in nature. It is something you only see in the Bible. Now we can understand why hesed is one of the most repeated words in the Old Testament. It's a centerpiece, not just of this psalm, but the entire book of Psalms and really of the entire Bible. Psalm 136, if you flip over there, uses this word 26 times in 26 verses. It's all about the loyal love of God. So is there a loyal God? Yes. Where do we find that loyal God? In the Bible. How do you experience this loyal God? Through covenant. 
Psalm 107 is very personal to me. It's one of those first passages that really drew me into seeing God's love more than God's wrath and his anger. I resonate with the metaphors that are used by the psalmist in this passage. I know what it's like to be a wanderer searching for identity and meaning. I know what it's like to be tied up in sin, a prisoner to sin, a man that's sick and lost apart from God. These metaphors that are used here serve as a perfect picture of what life is like apart from God in this world when we run from him. And yet what amazes me the most is that God responds to all four situations the exact same way. All four situations, the people cry out, and they're all delivered no matter what they've done or how far down the rabbit hole they've fallen. Some of these guys were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. They were at sea doing their jobs and a storm hit. Some were just plain lost in the desert. Others were rebels against God and end up enslaved, and still others were just plain foolish. But every one of them cries out to God. And Scripture says that every one of them, God hears their cries and delivers them. See, God will join into a covenant with anyone who will cry out to him, and he will rescue his people no matter where they find themselves in. This is what Hesed looks like. This is what covenant loyalty looks like. And whether life feels like a desert for you right now or it feels like a dungeon for you right now or a deathbed or a dead end, know that if you have entered into a covenant with God through faith and repentance of Jesus, God will be loyal because his name depends on it and he will never defame his name. So let's look at each of these things. Four things I want you to look at this morning. And by the end, I want to look exactly how God can be loyal to us as sinners. So watch how this psalm will continually point to Jesus. First thing I want you to see, that God is loyal in the desert. God is loyal in the desert. Verse 4, some wandered in the desolate wilderness, finding no way to the city where they could live. They were hungry. They were thirsty. Their spirits failed within them. The first situation God's people find themselves in is as if they're nomads in a desert land looking for a city. Very similar to Abraham's experience as he's journeying, looking for a home, or Israel's experience in the wilderness. We see the metaphor speaking of life in the wilderness as a desert. Some of you feel that way right now. If not today, I promise you, all of us will eventually have those desert experiences where we wonder where God is. A desert is a place we were never meant to live. It's a barren place where we thirst. It's a place where we're lonely. It's a place where we're vulnerable to the elements of life. It's a place where no amount of money or fame or success or family or friendship will do us any good because our deepest need is not money or fame or success. It's water. It's shelter. It's a place where everything is fading, a place where life is tough, where miracles are far and in between. It's a place where we feel like God has abandoned us. We pray, but we don't hear from God. And the desert is where we find much of our lives lived as Christians because we're pilgrims here on this earth. We're not made for this world or even saved for this world. It's not our fountain of living water. It's God is. It's a place we will all have to walk in our, we have to go through in our walk with Jesus. Moses did. The Israelites did. Jesus did. Friends, you and I will as well. C.S. Lewis in his chapter, Hope in Mere Christianity, wrote the following words. He said, most people, if they really learn to look at their own hearts, would know what they do want and what they want acutely is something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or we first think about a foreign country are longings which no marriage or no travel can ever really satisfy. There's something we grasp in that first moment of longing but fades away in reality. The wife may be a good wife. The hotels and the scenery may be excellent, but something has evaded us. The foolish person puts the blame on the things itself. He goes on all his life, thinks that if he could only find another woman or find a more expensive holiday, then this time he would really find the mysterious something that he's after. But I find myself 
But if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I am made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, it doesn't prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, only to draw you to the real thing. Lewis would go on to talk about how we're all like hikers lost in the woods of this world. And when we find a sign, a good experience of life, something meaningful, we call everyone to gawk at it and see how it's pointing us to the way home. The signs in this life is not life itself. The good experiences are all pointing us to the realities of a God that created us and shaped us and loved us. The reality of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Don't become enamored by signs, but rather become enamored by what or who the signs are pointing you to. Look at verse 6. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He rescued them in their distress. He led them by the right path to go to a city where they should live. Look at the response of the people that were in the desert. They cried out to God. It's not a pathetic whisper or a passive request, but it's a passionate cry for God in the midst of a desert where they have nowhere else to turn to but God. See, this crying out to God is the Old Testament version of when God says, repent and believe. This is what conversion is. All of us entering into covenant with God is coming to an end of yourself, realizing that you aren't made for this world and that you have wandered from the loyal creator God, but his arms are still big enough and long enough to reach out to you there in the desert. And notice, God was loyal and he brought them out. Not just tangibly, but spiritually, emotionally. How did he do this? He's led them straight to a city. What was important about the city? Cities were seen differently today, are seen differently today than it was back then. Today, people will go to a major city to go on vacation or to find a job or um, to enjoy time away. But back then, you looked to the city to have a family. It was a place of community, a place of provision, a place of resource, a place of protection behind the city walls from all the elements that were outside the city walls. See, church, God has brought us into the city today. And when you cry out to him, he brings us into the city, and it's called the church. Church is a place of community. It's a place of provision and resources and protection from the elements of the world system. You've got to be plugged in. Verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for the human race. For he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. What should be the response? Thankfulness. God doesn't ask a lot from us in response to his loyalty. He just simply says, be thankful. Be thankful. Be joyful. Be thankful for his grace and kindness. Why? Because God satisfies. You don't have to jump through any hoops. You don't have to perform any rituals. You don't have to give any money. You just need to cry out. And then you need to give thanks when he brings you out of the desert. Number one, God is loyal if you're in the desert. If you're here this morning, you're like, God, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I pray and I don't hear you. I've, I've called out to you, but I don't know which direction you're pointing me to. Can I just say keep crying out because he is loyal. He's loyal. If you're saying, God, I've been looking and I've been trying so hard to find another job or something, but you just seem, all the doors seem to be closed, just keep crying out. He's loyal. Number two, God's loyal in the dungeon. Verse 10, others sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners in cruel chains because they rebelled against God's command and despised the counsel of the Most High. Here's our second group of people, prisoners who are doomed to die, but they're set free. This is much like the story of Joseph in Genesis, or most likely a commentary of the people of Israel in Babylon. Many people believe that this psalm was written after the Israelites came out of Babylon, probably one of the last psalms that was written. 
And it is talking about the Israelites' experience in exile. The life of the captive must have been brutal. You've got to understand that prison life in captivity was not filled with flat screens or weight rooms or libraries or three-course meals. People were malnourished, beaten, put into harsh labor. And this is how life can be as well. Life living in a dungeon, feeling like it's weighing on you. It's musty, it's dirty, it's hard, it's painful. But notice why life can be like a dungeon. It's because they rebelled against the words of God and think we have better ideas on life. It is when God gives life-giving words on how to live in this world and yet how to glorify him and how to enjoy him. But instead of listening to God, we spurn his counsel and do our own thing. We turn our noses and decide that we want to be the master of our own lives, ultimately to our own demise. We find ourselves imprisoned to our own vices. We think that we're pursuing freedom when in reality we're putting ourselves into more captivity. Verse 12, he broke their spirits with hard labor. They stumbled, but there was no one to help. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their chains apart. I love this. Despite the fact that they're in prison because of their own rebellion, despite the fact that they are suffering because of their own sins, that when they cried out to God, something happened. Some of you have made a mess of your own lives. You've made choices that you know that you're suffering because of the choices that you've made. Let Psalm 107 encourage you that when you cry out to God, he hears you. Whether it was a mistake that you've made or the mistake that someone else made, when you cry out to God, something will happen. C.S. Lewis again said that through the ages when, when, when men needed wisdom, they would cry out, William Shakespeare, help me, and nothing happened. When they needed courage, they cried out for a fallen general, and nothing happened. But for 2,000 years, whenever someone cried out, Lord Jesus, help me, something happened. When you needed Jesus, when you cried out to him, something happened. When you were lost in your sins, when you were destroying your life and you cried out, he didn't just sit there and ignore you. He responded. God didn't just bring them out of prison, but he smashed their chains in pieces and set them free to enjoy and live in this world as he designed them to live. Look at verse 15. He says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for the human race. For he has broken down the bronze gates and cut through the iron bars. Their response is the same as the first group, one of thanksgiving. And the reason is, I was bound in sin, but he set me free. I had destroyed my life, but he rescued me. I was sinking in the miry clay, but he put me on a firm foundation. See, notice why they were in prison? Because they rebelled against God. So who's doors of bronze and whose bars of iron did God break his own his own this shows that God is not liberal or conservative he's not the liberal or conservative God of our culture because the liberal version of God would have never put them in prison to start with but the conservative version of God would have made them pay off every last debt that they owed But this God does neither one of those things because he is a loyal covenant God who will at time put his people in prison, but he will also get them out. God's a God if you screwed your life up. Number three, God is loyal at the deathbed. Verse 17. Fools suffered affliction because of their rebellious ways and their sins. 
They loaded all food and came near the gates of death. Here's our third group of people, patients on a deathbed. And we also find our third metaphor here of life, a deathbed. And it's one we find ourselves in even as Christians through foolishness. And we even refuse help. You ever been there? Life is like a deathbed when we give ourselves over to this world and all of its vain pursuits. It infects us with consumerism and self-interest to the point that where we have killed, we're being killed from the inside out as our hearts grow cold and callous toward God. We choose life to we choose death to life, decay to joy, idols of this world instead of God. We lie on this deathbed because of the trajectory of selfishness that's within our hearts. We grow more and more introspective, more and more self-focused to the point where we feel like we can't turn around. We loathe the things that we need like food and we chew on gravel instead. And as a result, we find ourselves on the footsteps of death. We do come what the Bible says are fools. And fools are described in the Bible as those who are morally insensitive and those who refuse to accept correction or discipline. Go to verse 19. And then they cried out to God. He saved them from their distress. He sent his word and he healed them. He rescued them from the pit. Here again, on the doorstep of death, if we cry out to God, you'll find that God is loyal. He sends out his word, and he brings healing. The phrase is a reference to a, a word of healing that's delivered by a priest or someone who had an illness, but that caused him to be excluded from the community. But now they see healing happen, and they say, you're welcome back in. This would be like a leper in the New Testament who was outcast, who was lonely, but God gives healing. Look at verse 21. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love, his wondrous works for the human race. Let them offer sacrifice of thanksgiving, announce his work with shouts of joy. Same response, thanksgiving. This time we're to offer sacrifices and to sing songs to him. Now that we have been cleansed from our sins, now that we have been made whole, that we could go into the sanctuary to worship God when we couldn't before, what are we supposed to do? We're to worship. The modern day application is that when God heals you of your dis destructive thirst for habitual sin, you enter into the courts with joy and sing with all your heart. And listen, this response is serious because God is serious about his glory and your joy. The lack of thankfulness on our part is academic. When was the last time you thanked God for his loyalty to you, whether you were in the desert or you were in the dungeon or you were on the deathbed and you were delivered? Whining, complaining. Friends, have no place in the people of God. We should be the most thankful people in the world. And listen, a little... God, thank you for my food before I eat. Doesn't cut it. God deserves more time, more attention, more focus than that. When God wanted to describe the unbeliever and why, they, why the unbeliever would be judged, here's what he says, Romans 1. He says, although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God, and they didn't give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking, their foolish hearts were, hearkened, were hardened, darkened. Look at 2 Timothy. It says, but understand this, that in the last days there will be times of difficulty. For people will become lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. Ungrateful. Why is this such a big deal? Because ungratefulness robs God of his glory. He is the giver. And the giver should always get the glory. I don't know, but maybe today you and I need to repent of our relentless unthankfulness, our constant complaining. Don't think that our unthankfulness is this lesser sin that, hey, at least I don't commit adultery or look at pornography. At least I'm not out there doing murder or theft. 
When was the last time you gave heartful thanks to God for his deliverance in your life? When's the last time you just said, God, thank you? Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for blessing me. As you examine the words of your week, is it filled more with complaining and bickering? Or are you trying to find God in the midst of everything that's going wrong? When's the last time you just paused and said, God, I don't deserve this, but you're so good to me. You're so faithful to me. I deserve condemnation. I deserve hell. I deserve the worst that you could possibly give me. But God, you have done more than I deserve. You have made me your own. You have said you will never leave me. You'll never forsake me. You'll never abandon me. You will call me son. You will call me daughter. And I have the privilege that any time I need, I can go to you because I know not only will you hear me, but you're a God who can act on my behalf. You are good. You are faithful. Thank you. See, if we don't have this habit of being thankful, we will become like the Israelites in the wilderness, bickering, complaining, always looking at the negative, always finding fault, always looking to find another reason to complain. But when we begin to pause and we begin to say, God, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for family. Thank you for provision. Thank you for blessings. You know what happens? Everything else begins to become minor details. Everything else becomes secondary because you realize that if God has been faithful in all of these other areas, these other areas where I'm struggling in, God can take care of that. God can work there because I can look and see all these places where God has been good, God has been faithful, God has been fine. And I can look back on my life and say, God, you've been good there, you've been good here, you've been good here. Now I'm facing this and I'm facing that. I can say, you know what? God's been good back there. He's good today. He'll be good when I have to face you as well. He will be. But if all you could do is keep focused on the negative, you will miss God in the midst of your life. And you will let the world and all of its trials and all of its pressure overwhelm you. When's the last time you gave heartful thanks for God's deliverance in your life? When you talk to your friends and your family, do you speak more of complaints of your life or do you offer thanksgiving for all of his richest richest blessings in your lives? What kind of words come out of you? Are they words of life? Are they words of death? When your friends hear you talk, do they hear Someone who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus? Or they hear someone who is just griping and complaining about every little thing in their lives? Last point. God is loyal even at the dead end. God's loyal even at the dead end. Verse 23. Others went to sea in ships. They were conducting trade on the vast waters. They saw the Lord's works, his wonderful works in the deep. And he spoke and he raised a tempest that stirred up the waves of the sea, rising up to the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and all of their skill became useless. Here's the final group of people, the final metaphor. Sailors are lost at sea in a storm who find themselves at this dead end, but they're ended up guided home like guys on the boat with Jonah which history tells us they ultimately converted and began to be worshipers of Jesus. Here we find the last metaphor of what life is like at that end. There are times in life that you find yourself not at a fork in a road, but you find yourself directly in front of a wall. These men found themselves in a place where walls of water were all around them. And listen, they didn't ask for this. They were doing what they did every day. They were doing their business. They were going through the routines of life. They were trying to do their jobs. And they saw God's grace in creation. They saw God's grace in their jobs and their profession and God taking care of them and even giving them work. And yet, here they are facing a storm. They're pursuing everything right. And all of a sudden, everything begins to collapse. 
in front of them. Unlike the person that was lost in the desert or the guy in the prison or the one who found himself in the sickbed, this person had everything going well for them. This person is well off. He's got a nice job. He's got a nice house. He's got a nice car. Everything is going well. Life is smooth and instantly we find trouble hitting us. We find, and in those moments, we turn our focus from God to the things, the calamities around us. And the storm hits, and the, sto- and the smile is wiped off of our face. And the very thing that they were good at, the place where they had the most success and skill, sailing and doing business on the sea, at that moment, those things proved f- futile to them. It became meaningless to them. Verse 28. And in the moment, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a murmur, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet, and then he guided them to the harbor they longed for. Here's that response again. They cried out. What do you do when you're pursuing God and the enemy begins to attack on every side? You cry out. What do you do when you're faithfully loving Jesus and doing what he's called you to do, and all of a sudden life begins to become a shipwreck for you? You cry out. What do you do when you are loving Jesus, pursuing Jesus, being at church, reading scripture, and all of a sudden life becomes chaotic? You cry out. God stilled the storm. Peace came upon them. And as a result, they were guided home. Verse 31. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love, his wondrous works for the human race. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Again, what's God calling of us? That we would be thankful. A genuine response for people who in the midst of still pursuing Jesus, life becomes chaotic. What is God calling of us? That we still give thanks. That we're to proclaim him to others and lift up his name in praise. Maybe this morning you're here and you feel like a, you're at a dead end. You're loving Jesus. You're pursuing Jesus. You're doing all the things that Jesus is calling you to do, and yet life is still hard, walls all around. Maybe you feel like God has forsaken you. And I can tell you that no matter how far down the rabbit hole, rabbit hole you have fallen, the God, the God that we serve, the God of the scriptures will still be loyal, will still be faithful. He will not forsake you. Why? Because he sealed his covenant that he made with us through the precious blood of Jesus. And thus to the lost in the desert, Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. To the rebel in the prison, Jesus will say, if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. To the foolish that have destroyed their life is now on the deathbed, Jesus will say, I am the resurrection and the life. That even though you die, yet you shall live. To the helpless at the dead end, Jesus will simply say, I am. I am. See, Jesus is a city for those in the desert. He's a key for those that are in prison. He's a healer for those that are on the deathbed, and he's a way for those at the dead end. How did he do this? How can he make this offer to you and I this morning? By by entering into the depths of our lives and suffering and dying on the cross for our sin on the cross. Jesus entered into each of these situations, not because of what he has done, but because of what we have done, and it is the only way to rescue us and to enter into covenant with us. He entered into the desert and was thirsty. He entered into the dungeon and was afflicted with iron nails. He entered into the deathbed and took our sin upon his body, and he entered into the dead end and looked straight dead. He looked death straight into the eye, and he entered into it for us. Now he who had no place to lay his head left the city of God in heaven so that he could take us home into the city of God and give us rest for our souls. Now he who had darkness and the shadow of death come down on him, yet emerged from the grave, can set us free from the prison of our own sin. 
Now he who had nails that were driven through his hands and feet and whipped all through his back can heal us, for by his stripes we are healed. Now he who had the waves of sin crash upon him and went into the undesired haven of hell for us can now deliver us and take us into that desired haven of rest in heaven. Now to your pain, the gospel says you will be healed. To your shame, the gospel says you can come to God in confidence. To your rejection, the gospel says you are accepted. To your sin, the gospel says you are forgiven and God declares you pure and righteous. To your lostness, the gospel says you are found and God will not let you go. To your abandonment, God says you are mine. All because of his chesed. All because of his covenant loyalty, which has sealed us with his own blood. So Christian, no matter where you find yourself this morning, you can cry out to God, and God will respond. He is, as Augustine will say way back in the 4th century, closer to you than you are yourself. And if you've never cried out to God, maybe would you consider that God has brought you here this morning so that you would cry out and enter into covenant with him. The gospel, the gospel of Jesus is the fulfillment of God's chesed, God's steadfast love and loyalty that endures forever. Verse 1 says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Verse 43, the chapter closes, let whoever is wise Pay attention to these things and consider the faithful love of our God. As we come to communion this morning, would you consider the chesed, the steadfast love, the covenant loyalty of God together as we partake of the bread and the juice that reminds us of all that Jesus did so that we could be brought in. Remembering the body and the blood of Jesus that was broken and pour it out for us. Would you reflect on these four metaphors, and would you zero in on the one that you feel most at life, most at today?